How does that work? <clears throat> but the N and the T are the kind of important part of the personality test. Yeah, whether you're introvert or extrovert, you know, it's not that important. It does determine once you become a successful developer or a software engineer where you can go. A E can kind of get you into management because you can talk to other people and coordinate and stuff like that. I kind of locks you down to more technical work where you, you know you can be a project manager, but you won't be managing like a team of people. Yeah, and then the P versus the J, you know, is about organization. Okay, if you have E and J, you know, and NT in between that you can become a, a manager of a software development team because you have the organization on one hand and then you have the people skill on the other hand. So E and T, J would make you an excellent you know, technical manager, so you know, managing technical projects and people who are technical. <clears throat> INTP, which is me, you know, would be good as someone that you lock in a room you know, and then just say, okay, I want to get this done and then you just shut the door. <laughs> Don't want to look into the room while I'm working. <laughs> and then six months later, okay, here's the product. You just go, okay. I don't want to know how you do it. You know, I just want to make sure that it is done. So that's yeah. INTP. Is that EMP? It's like a lot of legit. Huh? Is it really fire? <laughs> Which one? Oh, the 911. 1911. I don't know. I don't have a 1911. You know, I just I mean, got I know a. I that they're that expensive to shoot regular bullets, but shooting an EMP, you think it'd be a little bit more difficult. The question is, can people aim? How do you aim an EMP? <laughs> how do you make an EMP without a nuclear explosion? Oh, EMP? <laughs> oh, I see, I see. What type of EMP? Because it's what it said. It's a 1911 EMP on it. Oh, uh, I think that's an abbreviation for something else. <laughs> Not much of an I will make it. Yeah. Exactly. And these days, you know, it's that, you know, it's EMP that makes all the difference. It's drones, you know, forget about line of sight weapons. You know, who want line of sight weapons? I'm not even there. <laughs> I, mean, I was just reading this article on the F-35. On That's the last manned, you know, fighter. Yeah, and they said it's all set up. There's no such thing as line of sight weapons anymore. It's all over horizons, it's all computer controlled. Yeah, yep. And very soon you won't need a pilot anymore, yeah. because you know just having the cockpit and life support and everything else that sustains a person inside um, is a lot of a uh, that takes up a lot of weight, a lot of room. Yeah. And it also yeah. limits what the fighter can do. You yeah. cannot like this because of you know uh, red out. Yeah, they were saying they designed it to, to pull like 60 Gs, which you no know, human can withstand. But it can, if it's being flown remotely, it can the frame can do it. Yeah, but no human can do it. Exactly. The only problem is drone pilots have the highest rate of PTSD in the military. When you if you're using the Xbox controller to drop bombs on mosques, <laughs> which is not the best one they're doing, is how the drone is stationed in Los Angeles. All right. So so we're gonna get the class started, you know, just to uh, just to repeat an interesting topic, you know, from the previous class. Uh, somebody was mentioning um, Pacific Rim, right? And you know how in that movie, you know, it's so archaic that you need not only one but two pilots, and they have to walk, you know, in a synchronized fashion for the robot still to actually function. And uh, if you think about it, you know, it's like, okay, why? Why do we even have people in those robots? You know, why do we have casualty when we fight those monsters? Because you know, it should be all either be remotely controlled or fully automated. You know, there should be no people inside you know, those you know, robots at all. And it's supposed to be in the future too. I mean, we can probably do it today. <laughs> and there's no need to make one gigantic robot to fight one gigantic monster. You just have a swarm of drones. I mean, that I think is the best way to do it. It's like each one is so cheap. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and swipe a few. You know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they keep coming. <laughs> but that's why we have classes like this, so that you guys learn how to program the drones, the robots, and stuff like that. <clears throat> All right. So the first thing we're gonna do is to talk about the homework assignment. So I will go over the homework assignment. I will do it myself. And as I'm doing it, you might want to ask questions, okay? You know, at a certain point, you think, okay, but I thought it's gonna be doing this. Well, stop me, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. 
Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started with the homework assignment that's due in well, about two minutes ago. It's called Nested Control Structure Traces. And here's the original document. And this is the way I do it. I just save the document to, the, to a folder. And then I open the document from inside LibreOffice. Go to that folder and open it up. There we go. All right. All right. So do you guys have any questions? No? OK. So let's go ahead and get started with this trace. Before we trace, OK, it depends on individuals. Okay, you know, so this part definitely depends on the individual. Some people can look at this code and figure out what it, it is supposed to do without drawing a map. Okay? If you can do that, great. Okay, you're right on time, right on schedule, because you know, that's what I want you guys to be able to do, is to look at the pseudocode and understand the structure of the pseudocode. Okay? Some people cannot do that quite yet. Okay, some people look at this code and go like, well, you know, I kind of have some idea of what is going on, but I cannot really tell, you know, where to go, where to proceed from a certain point. Then you might want to consider drawing a picture. Okay, because a picture, I think, you know, usually helps. So let's go ahead, let me go ahead and draw a picture first. And if you have any questions about the picture or how I draw the picture, ask questions. Okay? So this part is not going to be recorded because it's going to be done on the whiteboard. You are more than welcome to you know, take a cell phone, take a picture of the whiteboard. You know, that doesn't bother me at all, as long as I'm not in the picture. Okay, just you know, ask me to step over, and then you can take a picture of the whiteboard. Not a problem. All right, so I'm going to do it over here, you know, just so they don't have to kind of turn your head back and forth between the zero tone and the picture. All right, the first thing we'll do, maybe I should turn on the recorder. The recorder is on, but the mic is not. So I'm going to turn on the mic because otherwise, my I mean, uh, the this mic, not the USB mic. That one is on already, but I need to turn on this one so that uh, it will record without losing, without attenuating. There we go. Working. Yep. All right. The, uh, the way attenuation works with distance is every time I double the distance from my microphone, the uh, actual volume will be, uh, will be basically a quarter, okay, because it's the square of distance. The attenuation is proportional to the square of distance. So that's why, you know, when I step over all the way up here, the mic, you know, without the loudspeakers, it's not going to pick up the voice very much. Okay, it will still pick it up, but not a whole lot. Really, really, really faint. Remember last time, you know, when you're in class, it doesn't seem, you know, like you know, it's a big deal. Especially people who are sitting right next to my mic, you know, when when you're in class, you don't really notice that I'm walking that far away and my voice, you know, is is really really soft. That's because your brain is adjusting for that, because you can tell, you can see the distance, and inside your brain, you're cranking up that amp. <laughs> So it it's still the same volume to you, but without knowing no, without knowing where I am and just listening to the recording, you lose that information, and then you suddenly realize, hey, you know, the voice is just coming a lot softer. What is happening? So I think it's just that. Okay, back to the picture. The way I like to draw this kind of picture is from the inside out because this way I can make sure that I have enough room for everything else. So tell me which part or which control structure is the innermost part. Line 7 to line 11. Okay? That's one single conditional statement. So I'm going to draw the conditional statement first. I have to be careful and not use up too much space because I know there's a lot of stuff around. So I'm going to use as little space as possible to draw that conditional statement. It is an if-then-else statement, which means we do have two branches. We've got stuff to do on either branch. One, on one branch, we are implementing W by one. On the other branch, we are implementing Z by one. And then they have to merge into one and exit as the exit of the entire conditional statement. So the other part is, how do we decide which way to go? What is the question? The question is X mod Y is zero. If it is true, 
then we go to the left hand side, if it is false, we go to the right hand side. Are we doing okay so far? This is representing the code from line seven to line 11 in the pseudo code. It's just a conditional statement. Is that okay? After line 11, we do have a line 12. So line 12 is after the conditional statement. It is always going to execute after the conditional statement. And that says, you know, y gets y plus 1. So y gets y plus 1 is over here. Are we doing OK so far with this picture? OK, very good. I'm trying to find a pen where the, the felt tip is still OK. OK, and the different colors do too. Now, when you look at all of these lines, line 7 all the way up to line 12, they are inside their, the body of a particular control structure. What are we talking about here? It's, it, those are all inside a what? A pre-checking while loop. Okay, very good. So this entire thing, what we have drawn up to this point, is inside a while loop. So I'm going to draw on the side what a while loop looks like, just you know, in general. So in general, this is what a while loop looks like. You know, there's a way to get out, and there's a way to specify some kind of operation. But at the end of that operation, you always have to go back to recheck a condition. And you always check the condition before you decide which way to go. This is the general structure of a free checking loop. So we're going to put something like this on top of what we have already drawn already. In other words, the, 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 uh, the red portion is what goes into this block. So we go ahead and draw that. Okay, we have a way to exit the loop, okay, so we we'll draw the exit first. I mean, how you want to draw this is entirely up to you. Okay. But <coughs> this is the branch. When we are done with the last statement in the loop, we have to go back and ask the question, do we have another iteration? So that means from here, we have to go back to a point that is right before we decide whether to go for another iteration or whether we exit the loop. This. All right. So now we have a while loop, and with a while loop, you can see that on line six, we have to ask the question, and based on the answer to that question, we decide whether we go for another iteration or not. So the question is, y is less than x. If that is true, then we go into the body of the loop. If the answer is false, then we get out of the loop. Are we still doing okay so far? Because now we have the logic from line 6 all the way to line 13. What about line 14? Line 14 is not a part of this loop. It is right next to this loop here. So line 14, which is x gets x plus 1, is here. It is after we get out of the inner loop. So there we have this. Okay. And then when you look at line Five, okay, what is, where is line five? Where is line five supposed to be? Line five is before we get into the inner loop. So line five is going to be right here before we get into the loop. So we have y gets two all the way up here. Are we still doing okay so far with this picture? Okay. <clears throat> I'm kind of running out of space here, but that's okay. There's a way for me to kind of shrink this whole thing. Okay, so you take a look at this entire block here, and I'll just say, this is block A. Okay, it's gonna go into something else. Okay, it's like random space. So block A goes into what? Okay, it goes into the larger block, which is from line four to line 15. Line four to line 15 specifies another pre-checking loop. We already know what a pre-checking loop looks like. Okay, you come in, there's a way to come back into this point, and then you branch out, okay, like this, right? This branch just goes all the way out. In this case, it goes to post, because we don't have anything after line 15. This branch here continues to go back to the earlier point, because it, that makes it a loop. The, the condition to determine whether to continue with another iteration or to get out of the loop is on line four, which is x is less than five. 
If it is true, we go for another iteration. If it is false, we get out of the loop. What do we put here? A. A, very good. So we just put A here. And do we have anything to do before the outer loop? We've got some mundane stuff to do, okay? Nothing really exciting here. X gets zero, um, and then W gets zero, and then Z gets zero. Okay, like that. So that, you know, I just look at this one block because it's a sequence of you know, statements. There's nothing too exciting about these two. So we do look at so far with the structure of the code. There we go. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my screensaver so it doesn't uh, time out too quickly. So go to let's see here, display probably. set my screen saver. Is it okay to take a picture of this um, diagram pages? Yeah, absolutely. That's why they said earlier. Display. Ah, there we go. Blank after an hour. That should do it. But I'm gonna take a picture and then I can post the picture on Moodle so this way you know we'll all have access to the picture. My phone that is not particularly good, it's just a Nexus 5, but I think it has enough resolution to do this. Mm -hmm. I know you guys have fancy phones with zoom and all that stuff. <coughs> but this may suffice. All right, so now that we have a picture of what is going on, we can try to trace the algorithm because now we're just really following the map to do stuff. Okay, go to window, open a new window on the same document. So these two are basically exactly the same document. <clears throat> it's just that they have different views of the same document. Click the plus sign and we are now having a new sheet for the trace. Here's comments, line number, and one column for each variable. We got X, we got W, we got Z. They're taking up a little more space than they really need to, so I'm gonna shrink these so I can see all columns at the same time. And we have comments taking up maybe a little more space like that. So we are good for now. Y. Oh, there's, yep, there's variable Y. So we'll use this over here. Does yeah. it matter what order we put the variable? No, it doesn't matter. The order does not matter but they, they do have to be updated correctly, regardless of the order. That was a question back there? Oh, okay, thank you. All right, so we start with the precondition. Since I did not tell you anything about what you should start with for each variable, they should be unknown, so these are all question marks. Then we start with line one, x gets a value of zero. Go to line two, w gets a value of zero. We go to line three, z gets a value of zero. Okay, nothing exciting at all, okay? And line four is the beginning of the outer pre-checking loop. So this is where we need to compare x to five and figure out is it true or false, okay? Um, let's find out. X is less than five is, this is x, it is less than five, it is true, okay? So where do we go? Look at the map. We are currently, at this point, we already answer this question, x is less than five is true, so we go into block A. Block A is this entire block here, so the first thing we do is we initialize y to two, which is what line five is doing. So are there any questions about why we get to line five when the condition of line four is true? Because that's the universal behavior of pre-checking loops. Okay, if the condition is true, we get quote unquote, we get into the loop, which means we start with the first statement that is inside the body of the loop. The body of the loop is defined as after the while and before the end while. 
All right, what do we want to do on line five? Yep, go ahead. Uh, I was just say you forgot to put the two, the one. Yep, so we put the two here, and then we get to line six. Now from line five to line six is simply because they are sequential, okay? Line five doesn't do anything to alter the path of execution, so we can only get to line six from line five. On line six, which is the beginning of another pre-checking loop, we ask, what is the result of this condition? Y is two, x is zero, two is less than zero is false, okay? So where do we go? Look at the map. So according to the map, when the condition is false, we follow this branch here, all the way down to the bottom, which is x gets x plus one. But which line is x gets x plus one? Line 14, exactly. So we get to line 14. <coughs> 914 is just adding one to x, okay? But you can see that for each iteration of the outer loop, x is incremented. In other words, regardless of what you do in the inner loop, as long as you're going through the outer loop, x will eventually get to five and then you have to get out of the loop. This cannot be an infinite loop. Now the inner loop can be infinite, okay? We don't know about that one yet. But the way it looks right now, you know, the outer loop should not be an infinite loop. After line 14, where do we go? This We have just done the x gets x plus one, right? Which is the end of block A. When we get to the end of block A, we get back to this picture. We, we follow this path. We go all the way back to the beginning of the loop, which is equivalent to which line? Line four, that's it. Okay. So we get back to line four, and then we ask the question again, x is less than five is still true because x is one at this point, one is less than five. Um, and then we continue to go to which line again? Five. Line five, okay? But is everybody seeing why we go from line four to line five? Because line five is the beginning of the body of the loop, okay? And when the condition of the loop is true, you go into the body of the loop. So line five is going to reinitialize the value of y to two, but I already mentioned this earlier in earlier classes, even though it had a value of two, you still have to indicate that it is getting a value of two. Every time you assign a value to a variable, you have to update that corresponding row, okay? So in this case, you know, this two is not just for documentation, it has to be here. I need to see this two. From line five, we get to line six. X is, Y is less than X is still false because X has a value of one, Y is two. So from line six, we get out of the inner loop, we get we end up on line 14. Line 14 is gonna add one to x, x goes from one to two, then we get back onto line four again. And on line four, x is less than five is still true because x is two, two is less than five. Yes? Uh, I don't understand why we go from line four to line four. <coughs> okay, line 14 is corresponding to this statement, right? Let me, let me label you know, the line numbers so it's easier to kind of cross between the two. This one is line 14, right? And line 14 is the last thing that we do in block A, which means when we're done with line 14, we get it out of block A. Is that okay? So when you look at block A, what do we do after block A? We follow this path. Right? And this path leads you to a particular point, which is right at this point, and what line is corresponding to that point? Line four. So is that kind of answering the question? Okay. So that's why, you know, if you are kind of more of a visual person, drawing the map and also putting line numbers can be helpful. Um, some people are kind of more abstract thinkers and they don't need pictures, or the you know, pictures actually make, make it worse. But for some people, the pictures work best. Okay, there we go. So getting back to the trace, we're back to line four. Because the condition is true, we get back onto line five. And this is where I will pull this trick of uh, splitting the screen into two halves. So this way, we can still see the header of the columns. But I can scroll the other screen you know, freely. So we go from line four to line Line four to line five, y is reinitialized to two again. We get to line six, and it is asking y is less than x is, what is it? Two is less than two is false, okay? 
So we go from line 6 to line 14. Sorry? Any comments? Okay. So we go to line 14. Line 14 is going to add 1 to x again. x goes from 2 to 3. And then we go back onto line 4. Um, x is now 3. 3 is less than 5 is true. Then where do we go? We go to line 5. y gets a value of 2 again. Then we go to line 6. Um, y is less than x is finally true. Are we doing OK so far with this? OK. Now, since the condition is true, and this is a pre-checking loop, then we go into the body of this particular loop here. So if I want to label the picture, <coughs> This part here is representing line 6. And this part here is kind of a line 7. This one is line 8. This one is line 10. And this one is line 12. Is that okay? So if I were to label the map to correspond to the line numbers, that's you know how I would uh, correspond the line numbers to the map. All right, so we go we go from line six, and you can see that from line six we have no choice but to go to line seven because the condition is true. Line seven is the beginning of a conditional statement, so now you have to compute what is x mod y. X mod y is the remainder of x divided by y. X has a value of three, y has a value of two. Three divided by two has a remainder of 1, okay, and 1 equals to 0 is false. false, okay, very good. So we just say this is false, and then we proceed. If you look at the map, when the condition is false, we go to the right-hand side, which is z gets z plus 1 corresponding to line 10. So we get to line 10 in this case, and z gets incremented. Z is this column, you know, it had a value of zero, it is now one. From line 10, where do we go? Okay, just look at the map. From line 10, we, we, there's no way to go back, okay? Line 10 does not go <coughs> back by itself. Line 10 has to get out of the conditional statement to get to line 12. So the next line to execute is line 12, which is adding one to y. So y goes from two to three, then we get back to which line again? Seven. We go back to line six, which is the beginning of the pre-checking loop. Yes? Can you explain line seven, x mod y? x mod y is the remainder of x divided by y. Oh, that's what mod stands for. That's what mod, okay. well, mod stands for modulus, which is basically the remainder of a division. Okay. <coughs> so line six is going to ask the question again, you know, y is less than x. This time is false because they're both three. Three is less than three is false. So now we get out of the inner loop. We get up onto, we get to line 14. We add one to x. X is now four. And then we go back to line four again. X is less than five is true because four is less than five. Then we go to line five. Y is reset to a value of two. We get to line six y is less than x is true because y is 2, y, uh, y is 2, x is 4 at this, at this point. Then we go to line 7. Line 7 is asking the question again, x mod y is, okay, x is 4, y is 2, 4 divided by 2 has a remainder of 0. So 0 equals to 0 is true, and according to the map, if it is true, we go to the left-hand side, and the left-hand side corresponds to line 8, which is increasing w by 1. So w is going to be incremented from 0 to 1. Oops, wrong, wrong cell. Okay, there we go. Oh, it is the right cell. Never mind. This is the right cell. It's just that I forgot to put down the right uh, line over here, which is line 8. What do we do after line 8? We get to line 12. This is line 8. You're done, you get out of the conditional statement, and then you get line 12. So we are on line 12 right now, which is just adding 1 to y. 
y goes from 2 to 3, we get back to where? We get back to line 6, very good. And line 6 is asking y is less than x is, is that true or false? 3 is less than 4, is true. Okay, we go to line 7 again. And then we say x mod y, what is x mod y this time? x is uh, 4, y is 3. What is 4 divided by 3? What is the remainder? The remainder is 1, 1 equals to 0 is false. So we go to the else branch, which is on line 10. Z is the one that gets incremented by 1. It, it was 1 already, it is now 2. How do we know it's 1? It's this update here. So now it is 2. From line 10, we get out of the conditional statement. Yep? Um, sorry, could you just line 4 after, after line 14? Or line 14? Line 14? After, line 12. After line 12. Okay, line 12 is here. So you have to follow this path, and it goes all the way back to line 6. Okay. What the, what was the question? I think I need to get your question. Um, I was confused on how. Uh, never mind. I think I think I understand now. Okay. Yeah, the picture really helps to kind of guide you, you know, and it, it, it helps you, you know, figure out what is the next step. So we are now at the end of line ten. We are, we are done with line ten, which is here. For line ten, we have no choice but to exit statement, and we have line 12 that is right after the conditional statement. Line 12 is just adding 1 to y. Okay, so here we add 1 to y. y goes from 3 to 4. And then we get out. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, we cannot get out yet. We have to get back to line 6 first. Okay, from line 12, we always go back to line 6. And line 6 is asking y is less than x is, what do you think? x is 4. Y is 4 as well, 4 is less than 4 is false, okay? And if the condition is false in the inner loop, we get out of the inner loop, so that means we get to line 14 this time. Okay, so t I think I got the question now. Um, we get to line 14 from line 6 only if the condition is false. But if the condition is true, we go to the body of the loop and we do something and we get back to line 6. On line 14, we add 1 to x. So x goes from, okay, it's a little bit awkward for me because I have to scroll. x has a, had a value of 4, it is now 5. We cannot get out of the loop at this point because most people can see, hey, you know, uh, finally x is the same as 5, it's time to get out of the loop. No, it is not time to get out of the loop just yet. You cannot get out of the loop from line 14. You have to get back to line line 4, answer the question, then you can get out of the loop. So from line 14, we get back to line 4. Then we ask that question again, x is less than 5, is false, finally. That is the reason why we are getting out, and then we say post. Are there any questions about the trace? Now you don't have to answer this question, okay? You know, I just want you guys to think about, you know, um, okay, two questions. First question, was I able to draw a map representing the logic based on the student code? You don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to answer it, okay? But this is just a question for you. Can you draw that picture based on the pseudo code? And then the second question is, can you follow the pseudo code without the picture? Assuming that you can draw the picture, but can you follow the logic of the pseudocode but without drawing the picture first? Okay. So those are the two questions I want you guys to kind of think about because if you can draw the picture, it's good because you understand the structure of the code. You know how to read the pseudocode. If you can follow the logic without drawing the picture first, it's better because that is what you need to become a developer, at least eventually. Okay, 
okay? So at this point, if you think, okay, well, I still need to draw a picture to get a visual understanding of the code, it's okay. It is not a problem. But just keep in mind that at some point, okay, in a few weeks, I would say, you probably have to practice this enough that you don't need the picture anymore. You just look at the pseudocode, you look at the text representation, and you know how to interpret that code. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so I don't need you guys to answer me. You don't really need to raise your hand, but that's you know, basically what I need you to think about. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, very good. <clears throat> now, with this out of the way, um, we are going back to the notes. Okay, we are going back to the notes, and we were talking about pre and post conditions of topic three already. And this is a rather kind of nasty chapter, I would say. Um, we talked about pre and post condition. We even talked about, you know, how to, oh, I forgot about doing that. I forgot about proving the uh, correctness of the conditional statement, how to find the maximum of two variables. So let's go ahead and do that again, okay? And this time I'm gonna shortcut the first part and just you know, go straight to the last part here. So it's a good reminder for those people who kind of, well, I vaguely remember what we did a week ago because we missed Monday. But it's also good as a um, good as an exercise for myself. Okay, two I two, Z gets X, Y is L, one four, Z gets Y, Y five is N is. Okay, so that's the code of you know how to find the maximum of two variables. Pre one is true, which basically means I don't make any assumptions. Okay, I'm just basically saying I know nothing about the value of x or the value of y. Okay, we know they can be compared, but we don't know how they compare or the exact value. Pre two is basically saying if I'm about to execute line two, that is one thing. Okay. Technically speaking, we know that whatever is true before the conditional statement still has to be true because I'm, I haven't done anything yet. I haven't really modified anything yet. But on top of that, because I'm on the then branch, I know the condition of the conditional statement also has to be true. Okay, That's one extra piece of information. But we already know the precondition of line one is true. So we can now substitute t for pre one. True and whatever is just whatever. How do we know that? How can we make that simplification? What makes me possible to say that, to make that claim? Do you remember the truth table? Okay, so let's take a look at the truth table again. But this time, the truth table is going to be a little bit funny. I have x as a Boolean variable. It can be true or false. And then we have the expression of true and x. Okay. X being a Boolean thing can only be true or false. So let's say, let's see what happens when it is true. Let's see what happens when it is false. When X is true, what is true and true? True. When true and true is just true. When X is false, what is true and false? False. Okay. Do you see how these two call these two rows are exactly the same? So what is that telling me? It tells me that X is the same as true and x. In other words, this part is completely redundant. It's kind of like saying one times something in normal arithmetic. It doesn't change the value, right? So you might as well just get rid of the one times. So for this, we can get rid of the true and because it doesn't do anything. Is that part okay? okay. So I'm just doing this as a simplification. Um, and we can do something like this with pre four. If I'm about to execute line four, we know whatever is true before line one. It's still true because you know, the evaluation of a condition does not change the value of any of the variables. But at the same time, we know the condition of the conditional statement is false because otherwise I would not be in the then branch or the right hand side. Is that making any sense? It's the same reasoning as pre two except because we are on the other side, we know the condition has to be false. Just like before, we know pre one is true, so we just you know say okay, you know that's just t or true, and then the whole thing simplifies to just not x is greater than y, 
but we also know that this is the same thing as saying x is less than or equal to y. Okay, so we established the preconditions of line two and line four now. Post two is basically the same thing as pre two, except we also know one thing more, okay? Because we are not changing x or y, so the relationship between x or y is not getting affected. But one additional thing that we know is z is now the same as x because of the assignment statement. Post four is kind of the same thing, pre four, not pre two. But we also know in this case, the result of executing line four is z would have the same value as y. Now, I'm gonna spell this out, okay? Because pre two is saying x is greater than y. Okay, I'm just gonna spell this out. And we'll spell out the other one as well. x is less than or equal to y, and z equals to y. Here we go. So we talk about post five, which is, you know, okay, when the entire uh, conditional statement is done, when the two branches, after the two branches merge, what can I conclude? Well, not a whole lot more than what I already know, okay, because we know post two is one potential result, but post four is the other potential result. If I'm already standing after the merge point, I don't know which way I came from. The only thing I know is I came from one of the two branches. So at least one of these two conditions have to be true. Now in certain cases, both can be true at the same time. I cannot exclude the possibility that they can both be true. So that's why I cannot use the exclusive or. I can only use a regular or to basically say at least one of these two has to be true. That's all I can conclude. Is that okay? All right. So now that I know what is Post two and what is post four, I can just expand that. So I can now say blah blah or blah blah. And the first one is post two, which is this one. And then the second one is this one, which I can put here. So that's where we, you know, kind of ended up with last Thursday, and I was in the process of, you know, making this work so that it matches the description of the maximum of the two variables. So we want to work from here and eventually derive something that is the, this particular condition here. Because what we want is something like this. We want, you know, um, <coughs> z is greater than or equal to x <coughs> and z is greater than or equal to y and z equals to one of them at least. So e equals x or z equals y. That's what we want to end up as. All right, so what can we do to make that happen? <coughs> That's the question. Yep. Uh, okay. We know that x is greater than y and x is less than equal to y. Or, uh, okay, so the first thing we want to do, which I did not do on last Wednesday, is to relate not only x and y, but we want to relate x to z, okay? And we also want to relate y to z also, okay? And we can do that because in the first conjunction, which is the part that I'm pointing at right now, we know that z and x are really the same thing. So if we know that x is greater than y, we also know that z is greater than y. So that's the trick, okay? That's the trick that I didn't do last um, Wednesday. So that means, you know, at this point, I can make this a little transformation here and say that z is greater than y and z equals to x. Is that okay? Because z and x are really the same thing. If one of them is greater than y, the other one is greater than y as well. I can do the same trick on the other side. I know that z equals to y, so I know that you know z is uh, greater than or equal to x. Is that okay? So now the trick is, okay, how do we get this and this out of the conjunctions so that they are over here, and then these two items you know, become kind of independent on their own? How do we basically move things around a little bit? Okay, there's one such thing called the distributed law in Boolean algebra, okay? It works kind of the same way as the arithmetic version, except it works you know, in Kind of two different directions. They go in two varieties. There are two varieties of the distribution.
So I'll just go ahead and describe the, the rule that I'm about to apply, and then I'll just go ahead and apply it. So we have A and B, and then the whole thing for C. Okay. It kind of fits the format because we have these two. We have A being this guy, B being this guy, and then C being this entire thing. Is that okay? That's one way to look at it. But we can rewrite this whole thing. You know, three bars means you know, it's equivalent to, which means you know, they're interchangeable. <coughs> So this whole thing can be rewritten as A or C and A, a B or C, B or C, okay? It looks just like the distributive law in arithmetic, except it applies to Boolean operation. Is that okay? So I'm going to apply this twice, okay, and see what happens. So when I apply that twice, I will end up with four terms, and they will all be connected by conjunctions. So I know already ahead of time that we'll end up with something like this. Inside each term, there is an OR, okay, because we are distributing the AND over the OR. Now it is just a matter of you know, picking the first of the first conjunction, picking the first of the second conjunction, put those two together, and so on. It's just a cross product thing. So we just say, okay, let's pick out the first one out of the first conjunction, stash it here, and stash it over here. Pick out the second one, stash it here, and then stash it here. And then we pick out the, 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 the first item of the second one, and then stash it to the first two items. So we stash it here, we stash it over here, and I'm going to do a line break here, yeah, because it's, otherwise it's going to wrap around and be difficult to read. Okay, so let me take care of that. Oh, okay, so now we have to pick up the second item of the second conjunction and distribute it over here and over here. Okay, now we should have all four possible combinations, you know, the, the four ways to combine you know, these individual items. You guys can you know, kind of work out the mechanics a little bit later, but I'm pretty convinced that this is correct. Okay, but out of this whole thing, okay, it doesn't look like what I want to have as an end result, except, well, this guy is here. I'm kind of glad that it's, it's already there. But what about the other items? You know, they're kind of all over the place. What do we do to simplify these items? Let's take a look at hmm, z is greater than or equal to X. Let's look at this one here. Do we spot something like that? Yes? I know. X is less than or equal to Z. Yeah, we pick it up here. But but this one has got an attachment to Z equals to X. Can we simplify? Okay, so let, let's let's take a look at this one here and we'll see whether we can simplify this guy here. I'm just gonna highlight the one that I'm looking at and will say, can we simplify this one? And if so, how am I going to simplify that? So let's, let's just listen to what it means, OK? It means x equals z, or z is greater than or equal to x. How can you simplify this? But this isn't it kind of redundant as to the Yes. But which part is the one that you can get rid of without, without changing the meaning of the entire structure? When you have a disjunction, you pick the one that is more inclusive. So out of the two comparisons, which one is more inclusive? Get rid, getting rid of z equals x. Right, because greater than or equal to is more inclusive than equal to something. Okay, So that whole thing becomes something that I want, right? So now I, can get, I get to say, hey, we can simplify that whole thing into just you know, z is greater than or equal to x, which is what I want. Okay, so we took care of one. Okay, this one is taken care of. Great. Um, what about the other one? What about this one here? Z is greater than or equal to y. We have Z is greater than y right here, right? 
So how do I turn it into z is greater than or equal to y? Let's think about it a little bit. Okay. If this one, okay, let, let's just simplify this one first, okay? So we'll just say and z is greater than, oh, that's an easy one. What am I thinking? Okay, let's just read it out loud. <coughs> Let me highlight which portion I'm talking about, and then we'll just read it out loud, and you tell me what you think. We'll just highlight the portion. This says z is greater than y, or z is equal to y. What is the other way to say that? Z is greater than? Or equal to y. Oh, that's an easy one. Okay, and you know, okay, this part we don't have to do anything about because we are just gonna say, well, the way it is right now is fine. Ah, but wait, 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 wait. But there's one extra thing here. What about this guy? Are we gonna do anything about this? Z is greater than y, or x. Z is greater than or equal to x. What are we going to do about that? It's already been said. X is less than C. It's already said. You're at the correct. Bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll, I'll, I'll just go ahead and highlight this one. And then we'll say, okay, but can we take it away? Because if it is not something that we can take away, then you, are, you have a more restrictive condition than what we want here. So we want to say, okay, this is redundant, but why is it redundant? If z is greater than or equal to x, oh, excuse me, I'm going to have to. That's my bad. So if x is greater than or equal to x, and z is greater than or equal to y, these conditions are already met. Right? The question is, can we prove that that is the case? How do we prove that? With a true false table? Yeah, with a truth table? Mm. Well, I suppose you can do that, okay? But you can also use the distributed law to expand everything out, and then you can see how those terms can cancel out. Okay, but we are not too concerned about the mechanics in this class. You know, that you have to do in CISP 440. So in CISP 440, you know, you have to show all the proof, you know, step by step. But in this class, we just say, well, it's close enough. Okay, so we'll just let it go. But we did basically end up with the condition that we mentioned, you know, many classes ago as the condition of finding the maximum of two variables. The significance of this particular proof is I prove the program or the algorithm is going to work for all values of x and y. I don't need to go through any trace. Okay? Yep. So is this logic all represented like hardware wise on in the firmware? That's how the how to execute it and just all this stuff logically. Is that, is that how that works? Hmm. Like each one of these logic gates would be a physical transistor? Everything in a computer is transistor based. So everything, including memory, individual bits, okay, in memory, um, addition, subtraction, comparison, you know, they all have to eventually translate into transistors. Um, in CISP 310, which is assembly language programming slash architecture, that is the class when you know I will be talking about you know okay these are the transistors. How do we make logic gates out of transistors, and how do we make larger structures out of logic gates, and then we have even larger things out of log uh, those logic gates and so on. But you are correct. Everything has to boil down to transistors. Um, but what we are doing here is kind of independent to the implementation because we are doing this derivation based on the behavior or the expected behavior of the pseudocode. The pseudocode is really independent to the implementation. You can do this with mechanical devices, you can do this with relays, you can do it with transistors, it does not even matter. 
because the behavior of the high value portion of this code is simply we evaluate the condition x is greater than y. It will give you an answer, true or false. If the answer is true, we execute line two, and then we are done with the conditional statement. If the condition is false, we go to line four, we execute line four, and then we are done with the entire conditional statement. That is the structure of the behavior of the pseudocode. And it is the behavior of the pseudocode that gives us the pre and post condition, the way I derive it. And based on the mathematics, we can now prove that this pseudocode is going to be right, it's going to do the right thing, regardless of the value of x and y. I'm not sure whether I'm answering that question or not. Is it okay or it's okay? Okay. Are there any other questions about this particular analysis here? Yep. Why is it an or and or instead of and and or? And and or. Okay, let me turn on the line numbers so you can tell me which line we are talking about. The last line. The last one? You mean here? Yeah. Because, okay, I can tell you exactly what. This thing, entire thing, simplifies to this. Okay. This entire thing simplifies to this. This one is just, you know, we just take it the way it is. And the first <coughs> item we remove because it is redundant. So, but because, the, because these are all connected by ands, that's why these are all going to be connected by hands as well. Okay. Is that okay? All right. Any other questions? Why was that redundant again? Why is this one redundant? Yeah. Because this part here is already guaranteeing that z is greater than or equal to x and z is greater than or equal to y. The other one is saying at least one of those two has to be true. But we already know that both of them, you know, we already know that this one is true, right? And this one is a more general statement than this one here. But because this one is going to be in a part of a conjunction, so if it is more general, we can just throw it away. Because somebody is already saying something that's more specific. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. So in a conjunction, you can throw away the more general statement. In a disjunction, you throw away the more restrictive statement. Is that part okay? Are we still doing okay so far with the logic? Does that look like programming to you, or does it look like math to you? It is both, because the behavior of computers it's mathematical, it's logic. Logic is math. So everything eventually boils down to mathematics. Okay. And tell me again, why is this approach being able to mathematically prove the correctness of an algorithm is better than throwing test cases at this particular algorithm and say, hey, it works in this case, it works in that case, it works in that case, it works in that case. So I think it's gonna work in general. Why is this approach better? It's a proof. Because it's a proof, it's conclusive, okay? If you throw darts, if you throw test cases at an algorithm, and it works in all the test cases that you throw at it, there's always a chance that you do not throw enough test cases. There's a test case that's gonna fail. You cannot prove conclusively that the algorithm is correct in all cases. But when you prove it mathematically, then you're basically saying yes for all possible values of x and for all possible values of y, this will still work. That is why you know, we kind of like to do it like this, it's, except you know, it's hard to do when you have millions of lines of code. Are we doing okay so far with this approach? Okay, so with this out of the way, we'll talk about something that is a little bit sticky, okay, to analyze. So let's say we have a line 17 here. And on line 17, we have x gets x plus one, okay. This is not something that we have seen already because the new value of x depends on 
the old value of x in this case. We are not changing it to something completely different. It is related to this old value. So let me see if you can figure this one out. So what if I tell you as, as a precondition of line 17, for whatever reason, okay, this has to do with all the lines before line 17, okay? But for whatever reason, I can claim this, okay? I can say that x is, oh, I don't know, less than k, and uh, y equals to x plus 2, and then the whole thing times J, okay, um, and as on top of that, you know, we also know that uh, uh, Z does not equal to W, okay. That's the precondition. In other words, before, right before we execute line 17, that condition is guaranteed. Don't ask me why it is guaranteed, because it has to do with the rest of the program. I'm not interested in the rest of the program. I'm only interested in the effect of line 17. So the question is, knowing this is the precondition of line 17, what can you say about the post condition of line 17? That is the question. So the post condition of line 17 is what? What can we really possibly say about you know, how x relates to everybody else? Let's start with the easy one, okay? the last item. Z is different from w. Does any change to x affect the relationship between z and w? No. Okay, that's that's the easy one. We just keep that around. Okay, so we can say blah blah blah, and z is different from w. We get to keep that one. What about the rest? We know that x was less than k before we add one to it, but now that we have just added one to it, x may not be less than k anymore. But what can we do to x at this point so that we can still establish a relationship between x and k? There are several ways to express it. I just need one. Because we know that 1 is now more than what it used to be, and it used to be less than k. So we can now say, hey, if I take away 1 from what it is now, then we, got, we, we get back its old value, right, before the increment. But the old value before the increment was less than k, so now we can say, hey, take the current value after line 17 of x, subtract 1 from that, it will still be less than k. Very good. And the same thing for the other statement, okay? So I know many of you like simplification, but I do not do any simplifications in this case for a reason. We just say, hey, that is still holding. That equality was still hold. Now the reason why I do not combine the subtract one with a plus two, because people can just say, hey, why don't you say, why don't you just say x plus one? Because I want to show you x minus one was is basically the value that x had before line 17. Is this part okay? Is that okay, concept-wise? Okay. All right. So if I give you, throw something even worse at this, okay, at you, and see, let's see if we can, uh, we can deal with that one. So I will go to line, okay, line 117. This line 117, and guess what? I'm not even going to tell you what I'm doing with x. I'm just saying this is a function applied to x. Okay, and the precondition is pretty much the same. Okay, does everybody know what is a function you know, in terms of concept as math function? Okay, so we don't know exactly what is f, but we know there's an inverse function. Does everybody understand what is a function as opposed to the inverse of that function? Is that concept okay? Let me test you, <laughs> okay, to see to make sure that we understand the inverse function thing. Okay, if f of x is two times x, what is the inverse function? How do we undo doubling? Solve the x and the y values in the prime. Solve the x and the y values and try and solve for the y. Okay, but but what is the closed form of the inverse function? Yep. 
x is divided by two. Yeah, x divided by two is the inverse of that. Okay, so you can you can even make it more general, right? You can say if it's kx for some particular value of k, the inverse function is really just x divided by that some value, assuming k is not zero. Okay, is that making any sense? Okay, what makes an inverse function an inverse function? If I apply the inverse function to the function applied to x, what should I get back? X. That's why it's called the inverse function. It's, the, it's an undo of a, another function. Is that okay? All right. So assuming this concept is okay, and you can always ask questions you know, when you say, okay, but I'm not quite getting it. If that is what I say, okay, on line 117, I'm just saying the right hand side is f applied to x. I don't tell you what is f. I only tell you that there is an inverse function. Okay? Because not all functions has an inverse, okay? But most functions do. And in this case, I say, I guarantee you that f has an inverse. Then what can you say about the post condition? Do we have to throw away basically everything that we know about x and how it relates to everybody else? Or do we keep everything? Just about. We keep almost everything, except we have to apply the inverse function to f, to x. So I'm just going to use f prime x to, uh, to denote the, uh, the application of the inverse function, because I can't really quite do the superscript minus 1 with a regular text editor. So f prime is not the derivative of a function, it is the inverse of a function, okay? Is that making any sense? In other words, where I had x, I would replace it with the inverse function of f applied to x. Does that concept make sense? Because it's just an undo, okay? f prime is going to undo whatever line 17 did to x. Well, but what do I get if I undo that? I get the original value of x back. Well, if I have the original value of x back, then all the relationship between x, what, used, what x used to be, and all the other variables will still hold. So whatever I find x if in a precondition, I just replace it with the inverse function of f, which is the right-hand side of line 17, with the inverse function applied to x, and everything else is that making any sense? But this is great because this is how we can go from one line to the next line because for the most part, many, many programs have a lot of x gets x plus one, x gets x minus one, that sort of thing. And guess what? If f of x is x plus one, does it have an inverse? Okay, let me just use the text editor here. Okay. If f of x is just x plus 1, what is the inverse of that function? x minus 1. x minus 1, exactly. You, you add 1, you subtract 1. Can we prove that this is the case? Can we prove this inverse function is correct for all values of x? How do we prove it? <coughs> just try this out. Okay, we apply f prime to f of x and see if we can get x back. So let's give it a try. So we say f prime applied to f of x is what? Okay, let's expand the, let's expand f of x first. What is f of x? x plus one, right? And what is f prime of something? It's whatever that something is minus 1. And you have to remember that uh, you know addition is um, associative. So that means you know, we just get x back. Because the plus 1 and the minus 1 cancel out. So this is the proof. This is a mathematical proof that you know, x plus 1 has an inverse function of x minus 1. Which is exactly what we did in the previous example with line 17. Are we still doing okay so far with this? 
Is that okay? Everything is good? Okay. So we have almost all the tools that we need to analyze just about any, any code, okay? except for loops. How do we analyze the behavior of loops? It's a little bit nasty. So we'll go ahead and take a look at this code here. While x is less than k do, x gets x plus 1 and y. This is the code that I want to analyze. Let's give these guys line numbers. Line 1, line 2, line 3. Okay. And on top of everything else, I'm going to say, well, before this, I have no knowledge of what is x or what is k. In other words, the precondition for line 1 is just true. I don't know what is, what is x and what is y. Excuse me, what is x and what is k. So what can I conclude as post 3? That's the question. What do you think? What should we do first? I would draw a picture. Okay. So I would draw a picture, and I'm going to draw it over here. I'm going to erase this. Draw a picture. This is an easier picture. But what we do with this picture is not trace it. Okay, we're not going to trace this code. We are going to analyze mathematically. We'll analyze this code. Let's see if we can, we can come up with a solution. Suppose it's a pre-checking loop. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and draw the shape of the pre-checking loop. So we have x gets x plus 1, which is representing line 2 in this case. This condition here is kind of a line 1. The condition is x is less than k. This is the true branch. This is the false branch. This line here is kind of a line 3, okay, because we have to talk about what is a post 3. Are we doing OK so far with the picture corresponding to the pseudo code? So what I'm claiming here is pre-1, which is here, okay? This is line 1. Pre-1 is before line 1, okay? So this is pre-1, and we're saying in pre-1, we know nothing about x or k. Is that okay? Let's deal with the easy stuff first. If I want to uh, indicate what is pre-2, what can we say as pre-2? If I'm about to execute line 2, what has to be guaranteed? Okay, this is less than k. The condition of the loop has to be true. Okay, very good. So pre-2 is basically saying x is less than k has to be true. Very good. But there's one more thing, and that's the one that makes it hard. How do we call this condition? After line 2 executes, okay, well how do we call this condition? It's post 2, right? It's just the post condition of line 2. This is a guaranteed condition immediately after line 2 executes. Okay, fine. It's just a name, right? Post 2, just a name. Are we doing okay? It's just naming it. But the problem is, post 2, which is whatever is true at this point, it will still be true, 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 that means pre-2 is saying it is x is less than k has to be true. But you know what? We also know that pre-2, post-2, can also be true. And we should use this parenthesis here. Okay? But I use a parenthesis for a reason. Because there's one more thing that can also be true. What is it? condition here. Whatever this condition is, okay, it can go through this and get to this point. Are we doing okay so far? There is an implicit merge to get to this point. The merge is the merging of this branch and this branch here. Whenever there's a branch, you can only say one of those two has to be true. Okay, so I can only say that post two 
or three one is guaranteed. Yes. I'm sorry. Can you say where are the merchants guaranteed? You said it's like merchants. Right here. I can get to this point from a iteration of the loop, or I can come here straight from the top. That's why it's a branch. So that makes the analysis of 3 2 a little bit difficult because we don't know how we got here. It can be one way or the other way. Is that okay so far? What about post 3? What can we say about post 3 here? How can we get to this point here? It is also after a merge. Because when we get out, it is after these two merges. So that means post three is there are two things. One is this condition has to be has to be false. Okay. So we'll say not x is less than k. But the other condition is the result of the merge, which means there is a possibility that I did not go through one iteration of the loop, in which case pre one would still be true. On the other hand, I can also be coming back from at least one iteration where post two is true. Is that okay? But what makes the analysis of this condition a little bit tricky is pre two depends on post two. And guess what post two depends on? Me too, exactly. So now we have a circular thing going on. Okay. Are we still doing okay so far at this point? Yep. Why does pre one and post two even have to be included in post three? Why? I mean, isn't it all said and not x is less than k? Well, this is because of the structure of the code. The whole point of the post three was to tell you the condition. But pre one may not be simple, like true, right? Pre one can state something you know that has nothing to do with x or k. It might say you know y is different from z. Okay. You have to keep it here. Okay. Is is, is that making any sense? Yeah, it makes more sense when it's not just true. True is true. Right. Yeah. But in this case, we're basically just saying okay, we don't know anything. We're just putting true here. Okay. So what if I make this a little more specific? What if I tell you that initially, okay, pre one is saying, okay, you know, I'm going to save you the trouble of not going through one iteration. In other words, I guarantee that initially x is less than k. What if I say that? Well, that really throws a wrench into this whole thing, doesn't it? Because now p1 is just x is less than k. So we put x is less than k here. And then we put x is less than k here as well. It doesn't help me resolving what is post 2. Because post 2 depends on pre 2. And pre two still depends on post two. Because this guy is canceled out by this one already. So we don't have to mention it again. So when you cancel it out, we basically say x is less than k and post two is pre two. But post two itself also depends on pre two because we just talked about the inverse function thing with x gets x plus one. So how do we how do we resolve this situation? Well, we introduce a concept called a loop invariant. Okay, so let's take a look at the word invariant. Invariant. Okay. What do you think it means? Don't look it up on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Inverse. Mm, not inverse. Okay. Okay. So, what does the prefix in usually suggest? You're inflexible. Inefficient. Not, right? Okay, so not. This is not. Okay, good. 
then vary may, means change, okay? And ANT is really just a uh, suffix to turn it into a noun, okay? It basically means thing, okay? Mm -hmm. A thing that does not change, invariant. So a loop invariant is exactly the same thing. It is a condition that doesn't change as you go through iterations of the loop. And it remains to be true that the loop is done. That is called a loop invariant. It is true before, it is true during, and it is true after. Okay. What do you think is a possible loop invariant in this case? Just looking at the conditions here, what do you think is a loop invariant, which is in the form of post two? What do you think you know, is a good candidate as a loop invariant? Yep. X gets X plus one. No, that cannot be a, a condition. Remember. X gets X plus one is an operation. It's, it's doing something, but it is not a condition. It, it cannot be true or false. Okay, go ahead. I was just going to say X is less than K. That cannot be an invariant because that condition is guaranteed to be false when you get out of the room. But you are very close. What about X is less than or equal to K? Let's try that, okay? So I am claiming that x is less than or equal to k is my loop invariant. In other words, I'm claiming that this is post 2. So we plug it in and see if it works. Okay. So we plug it in, and we basically just say that the post 2 here is x is less than or equal to k. Um, can we simplify this? Can we simplify x is less than k and x is less than or equal to k? How do we simplify that? This is a conjunction. We take out the term that is more general. Which one is more general? <coughs> x is less than or equal to k is the more general one. So we can just take it out. All right. Well, looks like we're going somewhere. If this is the precondition, what is the postcondition? Remember the inverse function thing, you know? So if this is the precondition, the postcondition is just saying x minus one is less than k, right? Is that okay? If I guarantee that x is an integer, what is another way to say that x minus one is less than k? Can I say x is less than or equal to k? If x is an integer, can I say that if x minus 1 is less than k, it's really the same thing as saying x is less than or equal to k? Yes. I can. So that works out, okay? Because the pre and the post condition works out very nicely. What about the post condition of this entire thing? Let's see, this one is a little tricky. Yep, go ahead. So that only works because you're working with whole number integers, right? Correct. Okay. Yep. But as a post condition, what is another way of saying x is uh, not less than k? x is greater than or equal to k. And now we are saying post 2 is just x is less than or equal to k, right? Can we simplify this disjunction, this form? Looks like you know, these two things are closely related. We can take out one of them. When, you, when you're in the disjunction, which one do you take out? The more restrictive one or the more general one? The more restrictive one in the disjunction, okay? So we take out this guy. Okay, so now we have x is greater than or equal to k, and x is less than Okay. It looks like a contradiction, which means you know it cannot be true, but that's not entirely right. Because this whole thing can also be simplified. How do you simplify this? X, X equals K. Yeah. That's the conclusion. So that's how we can analyze a loop. But the end of the and the analysis of a loop depends on one key element. And that key element is you have to figure out 
what is the loop invariant. Because once you figure out the loop invariant, then the rest, all the pieces will fit together. So sometimes you just have to give it, give it a step, okay? I'm suspecting this is the loop invariant, plug it in. If it doesn't work out, try something else. Alright, so we are running out of time today. We will continue with this discussion. There's no current homework assignment, okay? But for people who kind of have some difficulty with the homework assignment due today, you might want to go over the homework assignments a little bit more. Um, and I can give you something that is not graded that you can just kind of work on, and then on next Monday I can give you a solution. I don't have any right now, so I have to work on that. What's our test? The test is going to be on in week six, which is two weeks from kind of today. Yep. Is there any more reading stuff? Uh, just keep reading. You know the. Uh, so we are moving. On. We read after topic four. This is topic four's test, and after that. Yeah, you have to uh, read uh, erase. I have to uh, unlock it, right? Because you, know, you click on the those ones, it may not work. Yep. I did not take roll today, I forgot to bring my roll sheet.